2024 Australian Dental Students Association's Education Officer and welcome to our very first education talk. So the topic is wanting to work in private practice, the good, the bad and the ugly. So today we have the Managing Director and Founder of Smile Solutions, Australia's largest and most awarded dental practice, Dr. Kia Pedro. Nice to meet you Dr. Kia. Lovely seeing you as well Nina. Thank you. So we'll be starting off with kind of a hot topic, which is retainer versus commission, which is kind of an important one for recent graduates. So I'll just hand the mic over now. Sure, sure. This is a really interesting and contentious issue amongst graduating dentists because there is a common misconception that commission is better than retainer. Um, just generally speaking, just broadly saying, well, I'm on a commission, you have been offered a retainer, and therefore I have more chance of earning a lot more money in my first year or two of dentistry. In fact, I think that's not necessarily true, and it's sometimes even inversely true. The issue about a practice principal or a business owner putting a, um, a graduating dentist on a commission structure too early is that the dentist, the graduating dentist, is forced to work quite quickly and proficiently at very early stages in their careers. The second problem is that it also forces the graduating dentist to make decisions based on money rather than um, optimal clinical care. Now, even with the best of intentions, it still plays on their mind on a day-to-day -day basis, especially if the economy is a little bit tight and money is not necessarily um, coming in as easily and, and you're not able to see as many patients, it can potentially be something that plays on a recent graduating dentist's mind. Finally, a recent graduate needs to be given time to properly um, uh, manage a patient. So a endo appointment needs to sometimes be two, two and a half or three hours. Um, in the initial years, a crown prep needs to be set aside for three hours. Restorations need to be for 90 minutes or 120 minutes. So it's important to give that clinician the time to do the dentistry at a pace whereby they're not forcing themselves to work at a faster rate in the early stages of their career. Yeah. The other thing, that Nina, also is that there's more to those first year or two of dentistry than clinical dentistry. The things that you're really focusing on having come out of four or five years of university are all the areas of dentistry which I dub the art of dentistry. I like to say clinical dentistry is everything you do when the patient's mouth is open, whereas the art of dentistry is everything you do when the patient's mouth is closed. And so it's the art of dentistry which includes things like treatment planning, diagnosis and, and reviewing x-rays, having time to, um, to assess cases with your peers and your mentors, having time to um, sit back and assess a case and go away and learn more about it in order to be able to present to the patient. So all of those aspects require time. And if you're on a commission structure, you don't get paid for any of those aspects. And so it's imperative to consider being on a retainer for a period of time. Now the next question is, what should that period of time be? Should it be three months? Should it be six months? Should it be 12 months? Should it be two years? And I'd like to think that invariably, we're all different and one, young graduates might become quite ready to be, go, be going on commission in a period of say six or 12 months. Another may not be ready for up to two years. And so you will have individual variation. And I think then the option to go on a commission ought to be something that is a trigger pulled by the recent graduate, not forced upon them by the, by the practice uh, business owner. So what we do in the Smile Solutions graduate program is we offer a commission structure either at the end of 12 months or at the end of two years. And the graduating dentists, if they feel like they're ready to go on a commission after 12 months, choose to go and do so. Those that feel like they could benefit from another year of being on a, on a retainer, remain on the retainer structure. Interestingly and anecdotally, more than 50% of our graduates choose to stay, considerably more than 50% of our graduates within that graduate program choose to stay on a retainer for the entire two years. Now that's a very interesting little stat 
because when given the choice of being provided a very solid wage, and the wage does need to be solid, it's no good having the, the clinician working on uh, uh, slave labour rates, but if you have a, 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 a clinician who's afforded a very solid retainer wage that is somewhat akin to what they would be on if they were on a commission structure, then they're always going to opt for the, the peace of mind of being on a retainer for a more extended period of time because that allows them to have all those benefits that I spoke about before for a longer period to settle themselves right into dentistry. Remember, two years goes very quickly in clinical dentistry. So don't for one minute think you are going to be ready to be on a commission structure after um, three or six months. I don't think that you would be. And having had graduates go through my graduate programs now for over 30 years, I can tell you most graduates would prefer to be on a retainer for at least one to two years. Yeah. Um, so a question that we got quite frequently was how can recent graduates navigate the decision between retainer and commission in terms of like negotiating um, and having that conversation with their employer as well? Mm. I think it's a very important conversation to raise, not at the very start of an interview, yeah. but I think into the interview or towards the end of the interview, you can certainly raise it. Um, uh, and, and whether it be a first interview or a second interview, or whether it be the meeting that you have with the practice principal. Um, what you need to understand, however, and this is fundamentally the biggest, um, the biggest flaw in this negotiation process, is the fact that the commission is ultimately, in almost all cases, a percentage. Yeah. And what is forgotten, and I've literally quizzed recent grads about this topic over the years, and I would say on more than a hundred times. And on each and every occasion, barring maybe one or two instances that I can remember, every other individual that I have quizzed on this has got this aspect completely wrong. The commission is a percentage, and therefore it's a percentage of something. That something is the most important thing to actually assess. And what tends to happen out there is recent grads get so focused on worrying about whether they're getting 40% or 37% or 35%, or I know so-and-so who's managed to negotiate 45%. There's so much of that type of talk that there is the whole, uh, the whole pie is missed here, the cake is missed. You are getting a portion of the cake. You have to actually assess what the cake is. Yeah. And so the more important question you need to be analyzing is what are the practice fee structures of the practice that you're looking to join? Because if the fee structure, if you're, for example, just as a pluck, a, pluck an item number of a 613, a full coverage crown, if the fee of, of that practice is say $3,000 and you are on 30% of $3,000, you're still making $900 from that crown a preparation and insert. If however the fee structure is $1,500, even on a commission of 50%, you are worse off than being on 30% of a $3,000 crown. So that has some nuances associated with it. So you've got to ask yourself, what are the fee structures does the practice rely on giving very heavy discounts to be able to um, convert patients into treatment? And most importantly, is the practice contracted to various health funds? Because if there are various health funds contracts, such as Medibank Private, Smile.com.au, Bupa, NIB, and, and the like, then you are being forced to work with a, maybe forced is not the best word, you are being contracted to work with a certain fee schedule, and you may find those fee schedules are considerably lower than what you could secure in an adjacent practice where they are not contracted to those health funds. So you, you can assess that without necessarily asking all the questions. You ask for the fee schedule, so you can see what the fees are when you're comparing practice to practice. You ask what percentage you can anticipate to go on, so you can actually work out what sort of remuneration you can expect to make. And you pick off the eight or 10 top item numbers. Yeah. A, a three surface restoration maybe, a scale and clean, maybe some bite wings, maybe a crown, maybe a, a first stage of, an, of, a, of a root canal. You pick off some of the key item numbers and you compare them based on the percentage that you're being offered. 
And then you actually go on the website of the practice and you see what associations they have with health funds. Are they preferred providers for multiple health funds? Because if they are, are they a uh, provider for smile.com.au? Are they a provider for various contracted relationships, which will mean they will have to do dentistry at a reduced rate? And that is very, very important because we did analysis on this with one of our core practices, um, which has no affiliation with any of the health funds. And we looked at a 37% um, commission, which is what, what we pay our senior dentists um, at Core Dental. Um, and at a 37% commission on our practice fees, compared with a 45% commission working in a Medibank private preferred provider practice down the road, we carried out some analysis on the top 10 item numbers and the core dental uh, commission dentist was on almost 50% more remuneration in their pay packet than what the clinician would have been had they been working for 45% down the road. It's significant. The numbers actually do add up to significant variations. That's really interesting to hear about. Um, and our next topic is long-term goals. So what sort of long-term goals align best with working in private practice compared to maybe public? And yeah, I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that as well. Mm. So one of the things that I, I, I like to say is about this, when you start co considering um, your, the practice that you'd like to be working at, is the first thing I'd like to say, looking back on my 30 years, having the, the, the benefit of hindsight, is the years, and you've heard this from people of my vintage before, I'm sure, the years do, do go by very quickly, and your decisions are so crucial. And so don't assume that you have um, this opportunity to work at four, five, six locations in your first seven or eight years, because yeah. you will have wasted many good years. And especially if you are uh, considering family planning and parental leave, many of your years can get eaten into in those primary 10, 15 years of your career. So therefore, you've got to be very careful with your planning early on. And these are the things to look out for with your long-term goals. I always say practice, meaning I want, to, I want you to think about it like a sport. Practice the way you're going to want to do this when you're actually in a match. So you train in, in athletics or swimming the way you want to be swimming in the actual race in many ways. You want to train for basketball if you're hoping to one day become a basketball player. You want to train for soccer if you're one day wanting to become a soccer player. Don't go and train soccer if you're aspiring to become a basketball player. So therefore, if you have aspirations of being in a certain type of practice as your end game so say for example your aspiration is to be doing a lot of cosmetic dentistry for example yeah. then it's probably better that you put yourself in a practice from the very start that has growth potential for you to expand into the realm of cosmetic dentistry if your aspiration is to work regional and work in a holistic family-based practice in the regional um, areas then start your practice there so that you can start working towards that it's no good say for example working in public if you're aspiring to one day be a top cosmetic dentist on Collins Street. Yeah. The two don't marry. You have to learn the art of practicing dentistry a certain way in order to become that clinician in the long term. So that's one aspect about the notion of practice versus match play. The second one that I need to cover off and I've always just called this in, in its most simplistic terms A and B dentists. If we call the A dentists the ones that have aspirations of owning their own business one day, and the B dentists the ones that don't, they look at it and they think to themselves, you know what, I don't need the headache of owning a business, the marketing, the HR, the, 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 the stresses, the debt, all those issues. I would like to be a long-term associate as a, as a practicing um, clinician. You're a B dentist, whereas if you have aspirations of having your name on a, 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 a brass plaque at the front of a beautiful Victorian cottage, um, with a couple of other clinicians alongside you maybe, then that is makes you an, an, an A dentist. A and B just being two, two letters of the alphabet. And so in that way, what I always say is if you are, if you are fairly convinced which direction you want to go in life, then choose a practice that is akin to that direction. So if you are hoping to own your own practice or be a partner within a group, 
then join a group that has partnership potential and has that pathway for you to be able to go down that, that um, uh, aspiration. If you're hoping to be a long-term associate, then go within a practice whereby the long-term associateship makes a lot more sense. I'll tell you why, because in four or five years time, if you've got it wrong, you will have wasted four or five years of building a patient base. And that's a great shame because you will have to start all over again with your patient base if you then have to move practices after four or five years. So if you are hoping to one day make partner in a, in a group and you are in a practice, say for example, like Smile Solutions, well, it's very difficult to make partner in a practice like Smile, which has been owned by me for 30 years and I'm not looking to find any partners anytime soon. Um, and so in that respect, Smile Solutions is a great practice to work as a long-term associate, whereas you may find there are many practices that much, much better suit a clinician who has aspirations of making partner within that group. Yeah, and I think that goes really well with our next topic, which is practice ownership versus associateship as well. Yes, so I think, I think that's very personal. I think, you know, when I look back, when I graduated, I was planning to be um, a practice owner at some point in my life. And so I've, I've made the necessary pathways. First of all, I put myself in a practice whereby there was a, an avenue to make um, partner within that practice. It didn't work out for me. So that, you know, that was a waste of a, a year and a half or a couple of years of patient accumulation, um, which I had to leave behind because when I left that practice, there was only eight patient cards that was put under my under my arm and I walked away with those eight patients. Yeah. The other two years of patients were, were left behind with that practice. Um, so I think it's very personal. I think you've got to think about what your long-term strategies and what your long-term aspirations are. But what I have noticed over the last 30 years is whereas it was a quite a rare finding back when I graduated of people that wanted to be long-term associates most clinicians wanted to own their own businesses. I'm finding right now when I sit down and I talk to the graduating dentists and, I, and I, the ones that I have you know, gotten to know over four, five, six, seven years who have been in my practice, I've come to the realization that the, the momentum has greatly moved toward a lot more clinicians wanting to be long-term associates. I think that has to do with the way the world has changed, it has to do with the pressures of business, it has to do with the pressures of, of practice ownership. It has to do with um, people wanting more work-life balance. It has to do with also more women in dentistry than what there were when I graduated. And we find that I find as a rule, although it is a complete um, generalization, but it is a fairly, fairly um, uh, strong generalization in that I find more uh, women who are family planning are more inclined towards long-term associateship. And that's one of the reasons why industries like uh, law really struggle with retaining um, women in those industries because to make partner and working 80 hours a week just does not, does not um, cut the cheese anymore with a, lot of, with, a lot of, uh, with a lot of people. So in those industries, we're finding there is an exodus of women out of those industries, but we're finding there's an exodus of women into health. So whereas the most recent stats that I, I was uh, privy to showed that they're really struggling to get those numbers up uh, for, for women in areas like law, commerce and accounting, whereas in the realm of health there is a huge influx. And that has a lot to do with the fact that more of these um, young ladies are choosing to go down the path that gives them more work-life balance and more um, uh, opportunity to do less hours in the week and the flexibility of of being able to have children and raise their kids in a in a work-life balance environment mm -hmm. that is more akin to an, a long-term associateship mentality versus a long-term um, uh, practice ownership mentality which then begs the question and one of the reasons why when you look at the 12 graduates that we took on in the um, last year's intake within the Smile Solutions Group graduate program, all 12 of them were female. So that is not because we've gone out there and, and poo-pooed the boys, it's just because within the interview process, it became quite relevant with the boys that we did interview that they had no aspirations of being long-term associates. So therefore they were not suitable for our business model because they would have 
come in, work for four or five years and realize that uh, they want to own their own business and we then have to all hug each other and have a few tears and say goodbye to each other, which is not where you want to be in five years' time. Yeah. Um, how do you best manage um, work-life balance? So with your busy schedule especially, how do you ensure that you're still making time for yourself as well? Me personally? Yeah. Oh, just... Who asked that question? Whoever asked that question? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to catch up with them. Um, look, work-life balance is... Um, is not something that gets, uh, gets, I suppose, tabulated on a, on a diary or a calendar. Work-life balance is a state of mind. And so you have to fix the, the core issue with changes that you have to make emotionally, psychologically, and mentally. So you, the, the notion of work-life balance goes back to the notions of correcting and fixing some of those core issues that many young, young dentists and young graduating dentists suffer from. And one of those biggest uh, issues is a notion called perfectionism. And perfectionism to its core is all about the mentality of all or nothing. It's about um, uh, maximizing goals that you haven't achieved and minimizing goals you have achieved. It's about a dichotomous way of thinking. And it's not about being perfect, it's about being having a perfectionistic mindset, which is quite a dichotomous mindset. Mm -hmm. We have to look for that uh, middle ground, and there's a, I, I used to give seminars on this topic many, many years ago, a lifetime ago, um, two, three day uh, seminars around how you need to change the mindset so that you can move yourself away from that all or nothing mentality, more towards a balanced mentality. Now, balance and mediocrity sometimes is a dirty word, especially mediocrity, but it is only, it's, it's only within the realm of mediocrity and balance and averageness that you're actually going to find so much more work-life balance. You're not going to find it at the extreme ends of the bell curve. If you're an outlier, you're going to struggle. You need to somewhere be in the middle of that bell curve, and that's pretty hard for people who have always aspired to be amazing at everything. Yeah. Um, and I have a, a, a quote that I have said for many years. I say, all the, all the colors in, of life exist in the shades of gray between the black and the white. Mm -hmm. There's no happiness um, in black and white. The happiness actually sits within the gray. And that's where work-life balance sits. Yeah. And what do you think the best stage or age of your career to earn a practice? Look, it depends how you want to go about owning a practice. Um, if you are aspiring to own a practice within a partnership, that's very different to if you're going to go out there and start your own practice from scratch, which is what we call a greenfield um, uh, venture. So um, the most entrepreneurial within, within the people that are listening to me right now will probably be aspiring to owning their own greenfield practice. That's a different age um, I, ideally than the partnership scenario. Generally speaking, you can make partner within an existing group and that, that's both for um, general practice and specialist practice, literally within three, four, five years of being out of, out of dental school. Um, and so it's, it's quite, I would be saying to you that it's, it's, uh, it's, quite, it's quite a nice pathway to join a group of three or four business partners um, and aspire towards, towards working into and making partner within that group. And that may not be an equal partner, depends what sort of associateship or partnership structure is, is, um, is uh, put together. And it may be a smaller shareholding, but you can make partner fairly quickly. And it would be safe to do so because you still have the entire support structure around you of those senior partners of the existing um, goodwill of the practice, of the existing intellectual property that exists with, within the practice. All the systems and processes that already exist within the practice are there. You are simply basically um, uh, tagging on as a junior partner within the group, learning the art of becoming part of the decision-making process of that business. If, however, you're aspiring to become a entrepreneurial greenfield business owner, I would not be recommending that after three or four years. Now, I do have to say, I have a caveat on that, that I started myself within 18 months. And so, um, uh, you know, I would have to, at this moment, say that I'm not necessarily preaching what I did myself, but I would say if you're looking to start greenfield, you're much better off 
doing so after six, seven, eight, nine, ten years of practice because then you will have built up a great deal of both clinical competence and um, the art of dentistry competence in order to start be able to focus then on the business aspect of it to build your greenfield practice because you are then going to be the one who's mentoring the, uh, the junior dentists that are going to be joining your practice. You are the one that's going to be driving much of the clinical innovation of that business, much of the, um, uh, the, the, the business um, challenges um, and the patient management challenges. So all of those things have got to come together and you need to be a little bit more cooked than, than being so raw at three, four, five years. And I think the greenfield setup needs to come a little bit later. One of the things that I see with a lot of the uh, greenfield business models that are out there right now, where I see a lot of holes in the, in the provision of their care, especially the ones that have become so aggressive towards providing consumer dentistry or sales-centric dentistry is what I call it, is they graduated and they became greenfield practice owners very, very early on. And I often, you know, have a giggle about the fact that here are, you know, clinicians who've only been out for six, seven or eight years and they're teaching other clinicians who have only been out for one or two years how to prep for years. Mm -hmm. And it, it, that is not the way the world should work. Mm -hmm. Way too early to be starting your greenfield practice. No matter how financially successful you make it through a self-centric approach, it's way too early for you to be a genuine clinical mentor and a... And a in a way, a business mentor and a spiritual mentor within the practice. Mm -hmm. Because you need to be all of those things if you want to make a truly incredible greenfield practice. If you could do it all over again, would you change anything about Smile Solutions? Um, the answer would have to be absolutely not. Um, not that Smile Solutions is perfect, but it's more back to the question goes back to the way I live my life. I don't have regrets. So um, I would really struggle with going back and and changing any of those aspects. Um, it's, it's, I, I feel like everything happened for a particular reason. Yeah. Every failure was there for a reason. Every lesson was meant to be learned. And so much of that became so real to me during COVID mm -hmm. when having been in practice for 25 or 26 odd years, I often was saying to myself, Thank goodness I had those 25 years of ups and downs and successes and failures to now deal with what I'm dealing with today. Because the key of eight years or 10 years or 12 years of experience may not have been able to manage this behemoth through the navigation of that COVID period and the turbulent periods we've had since with all the different challenges that business has faced, business and, and clinical practices faced over the last two or three years since COVID. You mentioned the less is more world. Do you mind expanding a bit more about that? Um, okay, so look, I came up with that name myself uh, just one day when I was talking to some recent graduates and I said, look, what I'm seeing is I'm seeing two very clear different modalities of, um, of patient care you know, be, be being created in Australia. One is the less is more model and one is the more is more model. Now, interestingly, we had the more is more model back in the 1950s, 60s and 70s when there was a high prevalence of carers and periodontal disease and there was a shortage of clinicians and clinicians were literally working um, eight, nine hour days seeing 60, 70 patients in a day. Um, and the uh, through the 80s and 90s and O's as clinical dentistry became um, a, a lot more technologically based and we started to practice a, a much higher level of, of, of dentistry whereby the advent of dental implantology, um, uh, uh, crown and bridge and um, endodontics became much, much greater um, uh, avenues of patient care as opposed to drill and fill and extractions and dentures. Um, the, the less is more model basically became, became what was created. And we found clinicians were spending more time treatment planning patients properly, were spending more time explaining things to patients more, quoting um, and uh, going through uh, risks and therefore providing patients with a much greater levels of informed consent. And they were offering more variations of treatment modalities to patients 
at a much higher level of technology. So the less is more model was created. We were consulting patients. We were spending time actually doing the treatments and we were charging more for those high-end difficult types of treatment modalities for those patients. But over the last five, six or seven years, we're noticing a push back towards the more is more model, whereby some practices, and I think it's quite unfortunate, are pushing for a lot more patients in a day, and they're achieving that through a much lower price point in the, in the provision of their care, whether it be preferred providers, whether it be um, uh, the the, the provision of care at no gap dentistry, whether it be the provision of care at reduced heavily discounted rates, whereby the price point is what's being put forward as a pathway for, um, for, for patient care. So we see implants carried out at a third or a quarter of the price of what you would see in, in most practices or in some practices. You're seeing porcelain veneers at budget prices. We're seeing all on four done by the, by the droves at, at budget prices as well. So those, so taking that into account of having the, the two options, the type of practice, as a graduating dentist, you've got to ask yourself whether you want to put yourself in a practice that offers the less is more model or offers the more is more model. So the differences are, you tend to find that in a less is more model practice, um, the, you might only be seeing six, seven, eight or nine patients in a day. Um, on a, on a very, very, um, uh, I suppose, high-end dentistry provision there, you might only be seeing one or two or three patients in a day, mm -hmm. where you might have the whole morning blocked off for some preps and a whole afternoon blocked off for some endo, or you might find you have a whole day blocked off for some preps. So the less is more model can be very minimal in the number of patients that you see. The more is more model, however, tends to be upward of 15 to 20 patients a day, sometimes 30 or 40. And in those cases, you're doing a lot more dentistry at a much lower price point, and you are gaining experience. And this is where I think the misnomer occurs, whereby you think and you assume that by seeing a lot more patients, you are actually gaining more experience in that type of dentistry. But this goes back to the conversation I had around the fact that if you're planning to become a basketball player, you should be trained in basketball, not soccer. And so if you learn your dentistry over your first two or three uh, graduating years in a more is more model, you'll always be a more is more dentist, yeah. more is more model dentist. You won't necessarily be able to go back to the drawing board and learn the art of dentistry the way the less is more model teaches dentistry. So if you are looking to see less patients, spend more time on treatment planning, the more time on consulting, the more time on doing higher end dentistry, at a much, much higher price point that is worthy of the work that you're putting into that patient and the effort and the, and the education you've had in that realm. And importantly, the technology that you're providing the patient combined with the, the whole infrastructure of your business and your practice that you're working in. If you want to give all of those goodies to the patient and you need to charge for all of that, otherwise the practice will go broke, if you want to give all of those things, you can only give that in the less is more model. The more is more model is very much a burn and churn, 1960s, 1970s style of dentistry, except we're not making dentures, we're giving them all on fours. We're not necessarily doing fillings, we're giving them crowns. It's just the same old, the same old kind of mentality, but with a different type of, um, or a different set of item numbers. Um, what are your thoughts on consumer dentistry practices? Look, consumer dentistry, what is consumer dentistry practices? I'll tell you. I think the, the notion that you treatment plan a patient, um, and I've got to take you a step back and say, when I first graduated 25, 30 years ago, the sales was a dirty word. Yeah. And if you spoke about the fact that you had to sell a treatment plan, clinicians would would frown at you and look down their nose at you and go, dentistry is not about sales. Dentistry is about clinical care. We are doctors and we wear white gowns and we are in a position of, of, of responsibility and authority to provide a pathway for our patients that is going to put them in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a, you know, the best possible um, uh, oral health condition as possible, as, 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 as available. Um, 
The challenge, however, was that as the years went by, um, informed consent became a much more uh, greater factor, whereas in those days, you know, sometimes the dentists would get away with doing the dentistry and then tell the patient at the end of the appointment what they just did, whereas informed consent became a, a big factor, quite rightly so, and, 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 and quite importantly so. And also what became quite important was the, was the patients seeking multiple opinions. What became also important was patients looking around and shopping around through the advent of uh, search engines and social media. And so sales became a part of the fabric of providing dentistry. And you had to be a good salesperson in order to convert your treatments into treatment plans into actual treatments to be able to fulfill the dentistry that you have spent so much time learning um, to fulfill. And so sales became part of the fabric. However, what we're now seeing like with most things in humanity is we're now seeing the overshoot. Some amount of sales is important. And in fact, I wrote, I wrote an article some 20 years ago about sales is not a dirty word. If you can motivate your patients through good sales, if you can motivate them to do the right thing, you'll be motivating a patient to choose an implant rather than a missing tooth, to choose an endo rather than extracting that tooth, to choose to have periodontal care rather than have gum disease, and so on. And sales plays a role in that. So sales was very important and still is very important. But what has happened in the, in the overshoot, which is what happens so often in, in humanity, is we are now having practices that have gone way too far on the sales element of dentistry. And so we're seeing some things that are quite unpalatable in dentistry. The utilization of payment plans as a weapon to try and get patients to lock in to, 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 uh, to a treatment. The notion of making a patient or utilizing very clever marketing and very clever salespeople to get patients to lock into a treatment plan that very day of a consultation. The creation of social media that is portraying a very, very warped perception of what dentistry is. And there is so many of those types of things that are happening right now that are, that are gearing practices towards becoming very much consumer-centric consumer-driven, sales-centric practices. So what do these sales-centric practices look like? And I'll tell it to you, and as soon as you hear it, you go, wow, I, I know exactly what you mean. They really only today, right now in 2024, they're really only selling three things, mainly. That is, the three areas where there's the greatest amount of margin in dentistry, the greatest amount of profit in dentistry. They are porcelain veneers, all on four, and Invisalign. Where, and they've pretty much given up on selling anything else. They don't care much for pediatric. They don't care much for perio. They don't care much for um, um, endo. They don't care much for um, um, uh, general dentistry. It's all about those three things. And you can actually even see it. You see these cell-centric practices when you drive through the suburbs, and they've literally got three massive signs out the front. It's always those three things. And so... Those cell-centric practices have now basically reversed the way dentistry is now being provided. And so what they've done is a patient walks through the door. It's not about looking at the patient holistically and deciding whether we need to first manage you through a course of treatment and treatment planning that's going to get you to um, through the phases of dentistry and get you to a point whereby we can maintain your oral health into the future for, for in terms of your, your dental longevity. It's not about that anymore. It's now about which of those three categories you fit. And if you're somewhere in the gray, you just have to fall into one or the other. You've got treatment coordinators that only specialize in one of those three things. And so therefore, the decision is made at often at the time when you make the phone call or when you write the email as a patient, which of those three you fall into. If you have a bunch of fairly bad teeth, well, you know, you're probably all on four. You're not a, a category which is somewhere in the middle of let's manage you with some three or four sessions of, of, um, of, of hygiene, maybe some a referral to a periodontist for the two or three areas of your mouth which require additional periodontal care, maybe the provision of some endo with some endodontist uh, 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 referrals and maybe have a general dentist within the practice do those couple of endos, maybe then look at uh, planning to improve the oral hygiene so that we can then uh, create a long-term strategy for this patient. No, it's not about that. It's about you've got pretty crappy teeth, 
So therefore, you fall into the area of all on four. An all on four consultant sits in front of you, the decision's already been made, and the all on four uh, consultant sells you the only thing they have on the shelf, which is all on four. You walk out and you've had 28 teeth extracted. That is the, that is the problem with consumer driven um, dentistry. If the end game is what starts the thinking, if the end game is either veneers, Invisalign, and all on four, then you will have to fit one of those three end games. And it's very, very sad that patients that could get away with some teeth widening and some resin and something quite conservative end up getting 10 pulse of veneers. The patient can have their teeth saved for many, many years where the good fight is fought through good clinical care ends up with a premature all on four. The patient who um, uh, basically falls out of those two categories and has some crookedness, well then you're perfect for Invisalign. And so that's the way that the cell-centric practice works and you can smell it. You, you can look at that practice and, you, and the waft just hits you under the nose. And you've got to ask yourself as a graduating dentist, is that the type of clinical dentistry you want to be provided? The Smile Solutions model was built on the provision of holistic care across the entire spectrum of dentistry. From everything from the most basic to the most complex, we offer everything from uh, the most basic uh, hygiene appointments combined with some whitening all the way through orthognatic surgery and, uh, and um, uh, complex class three orthodontics and everything in between. And that's the reason why specialists were um, always very happy and keen to join the group that's why the Collins Street Specialist Center was formed. And now there are you know, 25, 26 odd specialists under the one umbrella working together, combined with the uh, 60 odd general dentists and the 30 or 40 odd hygienists, because it is a holistic care modality. Yes, we offer Invisalign. Yes, we offer all on four. Yes, we offer um, porcelain veneers, but we don't segmentalize our patients based on those categories from the moment they telephone. They start with a general dentist and they're taken down the pathway of holistic care very differently to that um, cell-centric type of, um, of uh, business um, offering. Um, so what are your thoughts on the ratio of new patients to existing patients when you like join a practice, for example? Okay, so that's an important one in that um, this is where if you are joining a practice which is more of a greenfield-based practice versus one which is a quite a long-established practice, You've got to also ask yourself, is the practice that you're joining one whereby there are some very dominant players within that practice, like clinicians, as opposed to more equality across the clinicians? Now, what that then means in real terms is this. Are you expected to work off the scraps of the table of somebody else within the practice? Now, the scraps are usually, what they look like is usually the odd broken tooth, the, the crown that's fallen off that was put on, you know, cemented only a year or two ago that needs to be re-cemented and a bunch of hygiene appointments. It's that type of dentistry which is the scraps that fall off a table, which I think is important to have. Yeah. As a recent graduating dentist, you still have to have some scraps off the table because those elements of dentistry will teach you or those elements will teach you certain aspects of dentistry which you need to learn. But it's also just as equally important that you get fresh, green, brand new patients. That you can, from day one, start to treatment plan and, and uh, consult and carry out their treatment from start to finish, obviously with the help of your mentors and with any referrals that you require in order to be able to fulfill the full uh, uh, complement of dentistry for this patient. So that balance is important. And in that interview process, you've got to really gauge whether you're going to get that balance. Are you, is every new patient going to be given to the practice principals and the practice seniors, and you are only ever going to have to live off the scraps? Or are you going to get completely and only new patients, which you build from scratch yourself, or are you going to get a mix? In my opinion, the mix is actually probably the best place to be um, as a recent graduate, because you will get to see failed work that you'll have to repair and fix. You will get to see emergency cases that come in at, at, during your lunch break because they've, they've got no other option to put that patient in because no one else 
can see them because they're, the other senior uh, dentists are fairly busy. And you get your fair sprinkling of new patients. Now, what is a fair sprinkling? You would hope, as a recent graduate, you would hope to be getting around two new patients a day that you work. So, in, especially in those initial stages of your, of your career, because you're building up momentum and you're building up these cases. And so, one to two would be a nice balance. If you're only seeing one new patient a week, that just will not be enough to, um, to get you off the ground with proper treatment planning and getting the experience that you need. Um, you, you really, I think, need about one to two patients a day. Yeah. And our next topic is visual analysis of appointment books. Yeah, visual. Now, I like the visual thing because one of the things that I often say is I say, in, in, in the interview process and in the process of deciding where you want to be working as a recent graduate, I say this fundamental um, thing, which is the most important um, it's the most, I think it's singly the most important thing you can remember going into an interview, which is only believe your eyes. Do not believe your ears. Because words are cheap and a lot can be promised and a lot can be said. Whereas what you can see with your eyes is real time, present tense, what is available there and then. And that is singularly the most powerful thing to look for. So everywhere you use your eyes. And I'll give you examples of that. One example is, if you go there and you visually walk through the practice, you can see the practice with your own eyes. Not what's going to happen, not what's going to be done in that extra room, not what's going to happen in the reception down the track, because they're going to be a renovation or whatever's coming. This is what it is right now with what I see. The next thing you want to do when you believe your eyes is you want to then look at the appointment books with your own eyes. The appointment books will tell you so much about how busy you will be, what type of dentistry you will do, what a ratio of things you will have, how many new patients do you expect to get. And so therefore, when you then also are able to compare yourself, or compare the appointment books of one of the senior clinicians in the practice, then look at the appointment book of one of the more junior clinicians in the practice, maybe even go back to when the last junior started. And say, so why don't you show me when, say, for example, Dr. So-and-so started two years ago, why don't we go back and see what their first six weeks looked like in your practice? And you can actually look at the profile of the types of patients that they saw. Was it an endo? Was it, an, was it a, uh, all hygiene? Was it, was it uh, restorative dentistry? What were the lengths of appointments look like? Was it the less is more model? What, or was it the more is more model? And so you do that with your eyes, not with your ears. Another thing to look for is look at the website, look at the way they're marketing the business. If the business is marketing the more is more model, you can see it with your own eyes. You can see it through that notion of discounted dentistry, the, the, the huge um, uh, bias towards preferred providers um, uh, uh, connections and the like. So I think it's important to really use your eyes wherever you can and ask to see things. I want to see the dental chair that I will be working on. I want to see the, 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 the average cabinet of type of materials that you, that you are going to be using. I want to see the CEREC machine. I want to see the laser machine. I want to see the OPG machine. I want to see the treatment plans that you're currently giving patients. I want to see the letterhead that we use. I want to see all those things. And that gives you a real insight into what that practice is all about. And you're certainly no experts at this stage, but you can become experts very, very quickly through just a couple of short interviews where you are seeing things yeah. as opposed to hearing things. Yeah. Okay. So that's why I say visualization is so crucial. Our next topic is comprehensive mentorship and clinical support. Okay. So look, this notion of mentorship, once, uh, once, and it's, things have changed back again, again, the pendulum has moved back because there was a period just pre-COVID, during COVID, and certainly post-COVID, where recent graduates were hot property. There was that much work out there, and recent graduates were in, in, in uh, huge demand, and um, uh, therefore, a lot of business models um, also the very structured corporates were very clever about this in going out there and creating um, some reasonable, some very mediocre mentorship programs in order to 
satisfy the market research that was being given to us, which was the fact that the thing that recent graduates look for more than anything else is mentorship and, and um, that learning curve that they're going to get once they graduate. And we spoke uh, off camera before in terms of discussing the type of dental degree that I got 30 years ago, where I, I think I quoted numbers of, you know, having completed 20 odd crowns before I graduated, having done more than 400 extractions before I graduated, having done, I think, six or seven molar endos before I graduated to completion. Um, and all the things that we did back in those days compared to the average graduating dentist of today, you can see why mentorship is something that they are very cognizant of and something that they have a huge appetite for because they are worried because they feel like they may not have had enough clinical experience during their courses and therefore require that mentorship afterwards. And that's perfectly okay. And that's fine. It's just the way the world is um, today. And so the, the mentorship program notion was created and accredited al across a lot of practices and in order to attract recent graduates. Now, I've been attracting recent graduates for 30 years. So I've been doing this program or this type of a program dating back to 1994 when I took on my first uh, graduating dentist. And we have many of our senior clinicians were graduating dentists with me many years ago, dating back to Sylvia Chuck, who graduated 23 years ago, who's still with me, James Vandenberg, 22 years ago, Yasmin, Yasmin Coulthard, and the list goes on. And right through the clinicians, you'll see many of them were part of a recent graduate program. In fact, we would, I would say more than 50 or maybe 60% of our clinicians started with me as graduates within the entire group. And that includes many of the specialists as well, who went off and did their specialization course and came back and decided to stay on with us as specialists. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, uh, the, the, the graduate program varies greatly, even though a lot of people know how to talk the talk. Mm -hmm. And this is why visualization is also important. This is why interviewing other graduates from within that program is very important. And therefore, you need to do your due diligence, you need to do your research. It's so important that the mentorship program is, is multifaceted. Now, I'll explain that to you. It's important that there are structured layers of, uh, of mentorship. So what do they look like? Within my program, or within the Smile Solutions program, it's very facetious of me to call it my program. Within the Smile Solutions program, um, we have the, the, the layers including starting with the most structured, where you may have a period of two weeks where you sit down before you even pick up a, a handpiece within the group, where you sit down and we go through every nuance of the practice and what you will be doing within the practice, such as item numbers, communicating with patients, managing issues with a patient, a, a difficult patient, a relationship with your nurse and your receptionist, etc. There is so much you have to learn about being inside a private practice. That is structure. Another form of structure may be structured lectures and courses that are put on by various specialists, dentists, practice managers, key people, key stakeholders within the business that will need to teach you various things for you to be part of the fabric of that business. Mentorship then also requires you to have a structured meeting where time is allocated each week or each month where you sit down and a senior clinician spends time with you going through your patient cases, your treatment plans, your x-rays, your diagnoses, etc. That has to be structured. And then there is the times that you have to spend with key people learning the art of dentistry. Because that's the piece that's been heavily missing during your um, during your um, uh, years of, of of clinical dentistry learning at university, and so you need to learn how to communicate with your patients better, how to look at your patient cases, look at treatment planning them, but also presenting that treatment plan, not just the clinical aspect of the treatment plan, but the but the 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 communication aspect of the treatment plan. Notions of discussing risk management, notions of informed consent and so on. So all of those things need to be structured within a proper mentorship program. And then you go down to the dynamics of the day-to-day, -day, which means you need to be able to be rubbing shoulders with clinicians on a regular basis. The more the clinicians often, the better. The more specialized they are in fields, the better. 
and the more available they are to it because they have a passion for wanting to teach the juniors that are better. And so sometimes it's good having people that are towards the tail end of their careers working alongside you because they have more time because they've done so much of the clinical dentistry. They might by that stage be a little bit bored with clinical dentistry and they want to spend a bit more time actually spending um, uh, teaching the, the juniors. And so it's very important to have that mix of old and young within a practice. I, I think that's an important mix to take into account when you are looking at the fabric of a, of a mentorship program. So that, because some of the old guys can teach you uh, removable prods that none of the young guys can. That's just one example. They can teach you teeth extractions that none of the young guys can. And so they, they come with us an, an amount of intellectual property that you just can't teach the young guys. And so... Um, and so the, the, uh, the ability to be able to just rub shoulders in a dynamic fashion, to just be able to walk into one of the other associates rooms and just show them a bite with, to be able to knock on someone's shoulder and say, hey, I'm stuck with this extraction. Can you please come in and help me with it? Because that level of, um, of guidance and mentorship is priceless. But it has to be one whereby you feel this sense that the fabric of the business is around recent graduates. If you feel that when you go through there, no one's got a lot of time for you. If you feel when you walk through the space that everyone's too busy and everyone's a little bit grumpy, that is not the great place for you to be able to rub shoulders with clinicians. You really want to feel like as a recent grad, you walk in there and the senior guy pulls you aside, takes you in his room and spends 10 minutes with you, 15 minutes with you, and shows you some of the stuff he's doing. Has a, has a bit of time for you. And you really can gauge the feel around that. So I think it's very important to think of mentorship as very multifaceted. And I think it's very important that you understand the full complement of what that mentorship looks like. All right, I think you touched on this a bit previously, but as a graduate dentist, time is essential. So to observe, to discuss, and to treatment plan, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, so I think it's important that as a recent graduate, especially in the first six to 12 months, that you are afforded the time blocked in your appointment book to be able to observe other clinicians, to be able to sit down and look at your x-rays and plan your cases and take the time to make good diagnoses, take the time to properly treat and plan your uh, cases, really look at the various options you can provide the patient and really understand those options so that you can consult the patients in due course and provide very good levels of advice around risk management um, and also that invariably give them a really good platform for them to provide you with informed consent. So that whole um, aspect of your clinical dentistry, when you become a senior dentist, will probably take a lot less time because you've become quite well-versed in doing those stages. But in those initial stages, you probably want to have a balance of between a third of your day dedicated to um, planning and strategy and mentorship and two-thirds of your day around doing clinical dentistry. Um, so I feel that that should be blocked in your book um, preemptively to ensure that that time is allocated. Of course, in the more is more model, very little time is allocated um, for that because of the fact that of the nature of the type of dentistry that you'll be doing, you'll be seeing a lot of patients in, in quick time, whereas a less is more model is a better proposition for that type of learning and growth and development. Yeah, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Kia. I hope everyone at home found it really insightful as well, and thank you so much for watching. Great, thank you.